All right, children, uh, it's time for Sunday School. We are going to be talking about sin. These are bad things for you. They are bad for your community. They are bad for your soul, and they're also bad for your music. My name is Nate. I've been involved in music for the past, like, eight years or so. I've played in numerous bands over the ages. I've organized festivals, numerous shows. I've done a handful of tours. Uh, there's a couple poor, unfortunate souls who actually have tattoos of the things I've made on their bodies forever. Uh, that's really stupid. Yeah, I just came off a really big, stupid tour that I shouldn't have gone on. I've been around. I've seen some quack, okay? I say all this to get a semblance of trust from you, uh, faithful commenter. I see you being like, why should I listen to you? Because I've been around more than you have, okay? I want to imbue a sense of authority between us, okay? I've seen bands rise, I've seen bands fall, I've seen bands go absolutely nowhere. And generally, every single one of them falls into like one of these seven categories, at least. These are the seven deadly sins that kill bands. So sit back, crack open a cold one with me. God, I love you so much. And we will adventure to the depths of musical depravity with the seven deadly sins of bands. Seven deadly band sins. During your time as a musician, you will be helped out by countless kind souls. These will be uh, underpaid sound guys, desperate starving promoters, sketchy homeowners, other musicians who think of you when they're putting together bills. How lame would it be to just absorb all of that support as if you deserve it? Stick it in your pocket and you just you don't give back. I hate to look at good deeds as being transactional, but like you gotta give something back, you know? You would be a nobody, nothing without the kindness of others in this industry. You gotta lose a little bit of that pride and you gotta give back to your community, okay? That means you gotta go to shows. That means you gotta buy some t-shirts every now and then. If you can organize gigs, absolutely hop on top of that. When everybody is happy and safe and supported, that is where the magic happens. That is how like music scenes just blow up all together. And uh, you benefit from that, by the way. It's the right thing to do. Don't just take and take and take. You gotta give back. You gotta help. You gotta be supportive. You gotta be a good person. Yeah, don't be prideful. Help others out. An obvious direction that you could take gluttony is like overindulgence of like alcohol or drugs at shows. Don't play gigs when you're super loaded. Like. Duh, you're smart, don't do that. Like, you know that those things aren't good, I don't need to tell you that. This is a potentially controversial angle to take uh, gluttony in. So, like, you're watching this video, you are a musician. Why do you make music? Are, are you making music because you want to make something beautiful and awesome that affects the hearts and minds of others? Or do you want to do it just to feel badass and, like, super cool and be thought highly of by your peers? This is where I think gluttony comes into play. Far too often, I see bands just absolutely sacrifice the basics of songwriting chops in favor of songs that are gratuitous, uh, fat, show-offy. They're essentially jerking off on stage. Stage. And the thing about jerking off on stage is unless you're really, really, really good, nobody wants to pay money to watch you jerk off on stage. I get it. You've been playing guitar since you were five. You can play all these crazy riffs and that sort of thing. But is it fun for most people to listen to? Are you having more fun than the audience? Does that solo need to be 40 seconds long? Do you need to have the intro extend for like two minutes? You're repeating elements. Do those need to be repeated? Can you cut those in half? The best way to make a good song, I think, is to cut the fat. You gotta ask yourself if certain elements are absolutely necessary. For portions of songs that repeat, what are you doing to earn the audience's attention? Why should anybody be interested in the song that you're playing? Are you doing anything to include the listeners in your line of logic? Like, listen, if you wanna make the crazy avant-garde stuff like Black Midi, Hecra, Black Country New Road, that's cool. But have you ever stopped and asked why they are successful versus other folks? What makes those bands incredible is that they're just good songwriters in general. They're able to take like these elements of like advanced music theory and interweave those so that they're able to like clue in the audience on what they're doing so that the audience can feel like they're a part of the whole thing. They never ever waste your time. They're performing for the audience, not for themselves making something dense and crazy, but making it accessible to other people. That is a sign of a really good songwriter, I think. If you are making music that is intended to be consumed and appreciated by other people, write music for other people. Do not be gluttonous with your songwriting. Cut the fat, keep it simple, stupid. Do not jerk off on stage. 
I see this one committed by older bands more often than younger bands. Envy. It's often closely related with a sense of entitlement sometimes. I've seen tons of bands that have been around for years and years and years, and they're still opening shows, and that makes them super mad. But the problem is if they headline, everyone's going to leave. Meanwhile, you get these trendy new bands that know how to work the TikToks and that kind of thing that actually draw people that are pulling folks to shows. I see these old heads getting mad at their placement in shows. I see them getting mad that they're not getting paid 500 bucks a member to show up and play a 30 minute set in some bar with 20 people. They'll just flat out refuse to play shows that could totally be helping them out. This is like a form of resentment and it is very cancerous. Entitlement, jealousy, uh, these are all one-way tickets to being hated in your local scene. Nobody likes folks with this attitude, you know? It's a little dark. Hey Siri, turn the lights on. Oh, I was thinking about it. Guess the sitting light doesn't want to turn on. You have to practice gratitude. You have to find value and worth in every single thing that you are doing. So if you're playing like a little house show, do they have a dog? Is the dog cute? That's part of the payment for you, you know? Like how many amazing opportunities and experiences do people miss out on just because they feel a sense of entitlement, of envy, sense that they are not where they're supposed to be or where they belong. It's contemptuous, it sucks. You gotta treat each gig like a gift. You are so fortunate to be in front of people. Every basement show, every bar, these are the culminations of the efforts of so many people offering their time out of love and passion for you. Play gigs. Try not to complain. Celebrate the successes of others. There are a couple different directions you could take this one. First off, uh, don't get greedy with your set lengths. If you are booked and scheduled to play for 20 minutes, then plan to play for 18. Shows are carefully organized. Tons of people are giving up their time to help you out, and you really gotta be courteous of that. Time is a valuable resource during gigs, and uh, you do not want to be hogging all of it. That's a good way to make enemies. Another factor of being respectful of time is also ensuring that your setup and your teardown process is extremely fast. And I swear to God, if I ever catch any of you wrapping your cables on stage, I'm going to drone strike your house. Literally just pick up your cables in a big bunch and then you walk them off stage and then you wrap them up, okay? Get out of the way! Another way that musicians can get greedy is with band power dynamics. Someone insisting that the part that they wrote makes it into a final song even if it's not necessarily beneficial to the song overall. That sucks. Hogging royalties on a song that was clearly written by other people. That one also sucks. That one will get you in legal trouble. I don't know. The most important thing to do is to just like be transparent with your bandmates. You gotta be clear about the expectations, who plays what role in the band and the project, what is expected of them. They need to understand what they can gain by being a part of the project and also what they're risking by being a part of the project. And like, who's the one who makes decisions, you know? If you need to keep secrets from others, generally that is an indicator that you are doing something wrong. Last example of greed, uh, share your gear for God's sakes. 90 99% of the time, the musicians that you are playing with are going to be more respectful of your gear than you are. They are not going to destroy your drum kit. They're not going to destroy your amps. If something goes wrong, they will replace it. Music gear is designed to last decades. You know, you gotta help a pal out because you never know when you will be in the exact same position down the road needing some assistance from somebody else. We are all working in the service of a good show. If you can contribute anything to help the night go smoothly, freaking do it. When you're working with any community in any capacity, uh, fights, disagreements are bound to happen. I get it, but keep that stuff private, man. You don't need to be making call outs because certain bands are not using fair trade materials in their merchandise. Did somebody's bass player tweet something bad in 2014? Nobody cares. If you want to vent dirty laundry publicly, uh, here's a good question to ask yourself, is somebody else in physical danger when this person walks into a room? If the answer's no, chances are it's not necessarily a matter of public concern. Keep it to yourself. Don't blast it on Facebook. Don't blast it on stupid Instagram. What is wrong with you? I'm so tired of people using social media as like a punishment form to end arguments, you know, to punish people for hurting each other's feelings and that kind of thing. You see this a lot with small communities. One time uh, I announced that I was going on tour with a certain band Somebody DM'd me and they were like, yo, you should not go on tour with that band. They are dangerous and they are bad people. And I'm like, whoa, really? What happened? And they said, oh, ho, 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 we have a Google Doc that you would like to see. They shot it over to me. I swear to God, one of the reasons they told me I should not tour with this band is because the singer's cat beat up their roommate's cat 
and they didn't pay the whole vet bill. That's it? Like, okay, if I take this band on tour with me and like introduce them to like my listeners and that sort of thing, is anyone gonna get hurt? Is anyone in danger? The only reason that somebody shared that with me was because they wanted them punished for a petty grievance. Leave that alone. I don't wanna hear about it. Uh, this stuff spirals out of control, and so it's really best to keep it for extreme situations when someone is actually in danger. If you have arguments, disagreements, concerns, grow a pair of balls and reach out to the person directly. 99% of all issues in your scene would be avoided if folks just spoke directly to each other instead of playing this weird game of telephone where they share something with somebody else, and then they share it with somebody else, and then they share it with somebody else. Like, if things are really turbulent, something you can do is you can reach out to a community leader generally these are people who like run venues they're like very prominent promoters you know or they're like the old punks who've been around for decades and decades who've seen a lot of stuff ask them to mediate a conversation between you two and hash things out it's like a sacred neutral person listening in you know and just to make it clear i'm not talking about like violence or abuse call that stuff out shut them down etc etc i'm talking mainly about like petty verbal philosophical stuff that bands yell at each other about all the time you know call out abusers call out people who are like violent and evil and bad and that sort of thing but like personal stuff shut the fuck airing the stuff out poisons your community it's bad for everybody it's cancerous it sucks engaging in the sin of wrath you will lose friends you will lose a place in the community tons of people will hate you and you'll also be poisoning other people against each other as well you need to know the difference between selfish anger and righteous anger they're two very different things it's way too easy to take the sin of lust and spin it and to like don't sleep with fans you know this. Playing in a band will eventually get you a weird power dynamic between you and a fan or something like that. If you're a really bad person, you will manipulate that and get sex. I don't know. If that's the only way that you can get your PP interacted with, you're a loser. I don't know what to tell you. That sucks. Yeah, don't sleep with fans. What a hot take. I know. Somebody give me the Nobel Peace Prize over here. Easy talking point. Nobody will disagree with me on that. You're smarter than that. You know that this is uh, already a big issue. Uh, you know, don't want to get all Minecraft YouTuber about it. I think there's a more interesting direction that you can take the concept of lust in. I really like what CJ the X said about this in their video, uh, similarly titled Seven Deadly Art Sins. Way better video. You should be watching that instead of this one. I think that their point bears repeating over here. Thank you, CJ. Lust can be the desire for success signifiers at the expense of art itself. Do you want to be making good music or do you want the stuff that comes with making good music? Stuff like money and attention and big numbers on your social medias and that kind of thing. A lot of people view success, like catharsis in their artistic journey, as big numbers. That is how they measure success, not how happy they are with the things they make. I, I mean, sure, that's a fact, but like the main driving thing that they keep returning to are analytics and statistics. And unfortunately, the easiest way to get those big numbers is to chop up your soul and grind it up and throw it into like the TikTok, Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts machine, you know? CJ gives this great, excellent example in their video. I'm just gonna repeat it. It's like seeing an opening band that the audience is not a million percent stoked to see. They could say something like, we are six ba bomb and then they get like a level five applause. But when they're like, who's ready to see 21 pilots after us, they get a level 10 applause. Applause. Congratulations, you said something that got a level 10 applause, but it wasn't what you want level 10 applause for, right? It's not the real thing. Just like how you can have 250,000 subscribers on TikTok, but like, do they like, like, like you? I got the tallest Liberty Spikes in the world. My name is and this is my song. <laughs> You got all these followers by acting a fool, blasting your song, jumping on a counter in Walmart, and that's the only way that you can get people to pay attention to your art. You are so consumed, no talent, mediocre piece of shit. Congratulations. I hope that says something about like your artistic merits. I don't know. It's really sad. I know that it is hard to get spotted. I know it's fine to get a foothold, but if the only way that you can get a foothold is to like be a total clown and delegitimize everything that you want to do, is that really success? It's like, it's like a monkey paw, you know? It's like, congratulations, you're famous, 
but you're a dweeb and nobody's taking you seriously. Also something you see is like a lot of these musicians, they have a lot of followers on social media, but they will only translate to like 10% on streaming platforms, 5% and that sort of thing. You have a million followers on TikTok, but only 20,000 on Spotify. Let that be a testament to your music. Are you like a, a content creator? Or are you a musician? Which one did you want to do when you first started with? If you want to be a musician, what kind of musician are you? If these are the kinds of things that you need to do to be, to get any semblance of attention. The For You page algorithm based content mills like TikTok and Reels and Shorts, they have incentivized clout chasing, this hunger for signifiers and that sort of thing. How much that actually translate to making a deep emotional impact on the people who you want to be reaching? <laughs> Gets a lot of views, but how many people are out there with <laughs> tattoos? He's got more listeners on Spotify than Black Country New Road, but Black Country New Road is selling out bigger rooms and more people have tattoos and folks get a lot more emotional, even though they're smaller. Heck, I'd even say like Home Is Where has made more of a cultural impact with a fraction of the listeners than somebody like most other TikTok artists that you'll see. You're so desperate for that level 10 applause, but at the expense of your soul. If the only way for you to find any semblance of success online is to embarrass yourself, delegitimize your music, do you deserve it at all? Big numbers do not equate to success. There are a lot of great bands out there that have three listeners and there are a lot of terrible bands out there that have 10 million listeners. You can tell music is sincerely good when you have kids screaming your words at shows, when folks are showing up with tattoos, when people are asking for t-shirts and they're getting emotional when they talk to you and that kind of thing. That's the stuff that dreams are made out of. You don't get that by pretending to be one of your fans, you know, did I just write the song of the summer? You just ruined it. You just ruined the moment. The people who are showing up to your shows and the sincere passion that they are showing, those are signifiers of success, not numbers. God, I feel really passionately about this one. Ooh, I think that sloth is the most insidious sin of them all. I think that sloth kills more bands than all the other sins combined. You should go start your band. You should make your song. If there's a little thing inside of your soul, release it, let it out, do the thing. Time is such a valuable resource. You're not getting any more of it. It's a terrifying, like, the scarcity once you really think about it you do not have time to rest on your laurels get out there and make your music don't be a perfectionist our excuses are dumb they're silly you are only deluding yourself make the thing if hey i love you can release like genre defying masterpieces made on an iphone on garage band and they like revolutionize things and freaking Montana. What's your excuse? The most disastrous thing that could possibly happen to a music project is if it is never born. I sound like a Republican right now. Art is the only thing that separates us from the animals and by God, you owe it to the moon, the stars and the bugs to do the one thing that you were put on this earth to do, damn it. It was Minecraft that told me that when you are old, the things that you will regret the most are not the things that you did do, but the things that you did not do. <sighs> just, just make stuff, man. I think that there are just more people sitting in their rooms, in their living rooms, thinking about how cool it would be to make music, to start a band, but they just don't. You can watch a tutorial online and learn how to make music with stuff that you already own. It's not like a crazy high bar to cross. Do you own like an iPhone, an iPad, a, a Mac, anything? You have GarageBand. Like I made my first album with GarageBand. It wasn't very good, but it was something and it totally changed my life. I started this channel years ago and the most consistent thing that I want people to take away from the words that I'm speaking is that I just want you to make stuff because that is like the most fulfilling thing that I think a human being can do is to make things. If you want to be an artist of any kind, musician, etc., do it. If four people like the things that you make, that is amazing. If nine million people like the things that you make, awesome. That's great. You gotta aim for the moon because even if you miss, you will end up uh, in a supernova fighting, I don't know, octopus aliens or something like that. Both options are super cool. You do take a risk when you start making art, but you guarantee failure if you never start to begin with. Sloth is scary. Just make stuff, make stuff, make stuff, make stuff. Please make stuff. I'm asking very nicely. Because if you don't make your art, there is literally nobody on the planet who can for you. You're the only one who can bring it into existence. So hop on that, please. And thus concludes our Sunday School lesson. I have a Spotify playlist down below of some sinful songs, if that is your cup of tea. Like, subscribe, comment, 
do the thing. I don't care anymore. I'm just making these videos for me. God is woman and we killed her. Blah. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.